Hello, my name is Alan Grucock. I'm here with Cancer Stories to tell you about my account. Did you know that one in 50 people every year is diagnosed with malignant melanoma? I'd like you to come and watch my video. I think you'll be intrigued as to what you see. I would like you to look at my account of what happened to me. My name is Alan Grucock. Um, I'm a 58 year old male. Um, I'm a joiner by trade, actually serving all different types of joinery. Um, I've got a wife, two lovely daughters, um, and I got diagnosed with malignant melanoma in 2012. Alan has come in today to talk about his diagnosis. In your case, I think it's a skin cancer. And it melanoma, is, yeah. And I appreciate you coming in because we haven't had many people with a melanoma come to tell their story. I'm sure the audience will find it very useful. Okay. Um, can I ask you how your diagnosis came about initially? Yes, I had a, I had a mole on my back. Um, we've always liked holidays abroad. We've had sun holidays right from when we were teenagers. Um, my wife's also got moles. Uh, which she gets checked out regularly as she used to be a medical secretary at a doctor's surgery. Um, she noticed the mole on my back was getting slightly bigger and changing colour so I went to the doctors in 2011 and was told it was okay so never thought no more about it and then we went away the following year to Cuba and it started to bleed so I came back from holiday straight down to the doctors and they said I think it's best if we take it off. So we went to the Leicester Royal and it was diagnosed as stage 2 malignant melanoma. How do you think the diagnosis was handled overall by the hospital staff? Uh, the hospital staff were very good. Everything was done in a very professional way. I was a bit disappointed with my own GP because the surgery is um, it's a joint business and every time you go there you see a different doctor and unfortunately you know the one that sort of said it was okay the year before mm. um, found out then that I should have gone back a month later to have it reassessed okay but it was uh, never mentioned to me at all so I had a bit of a downer on to go you know with the hospital with the doctors I, I didn't really like going down there because I just yeah. thought I'd end up losing my temper with them but Regards the hospital in general, yeah, very good, very professional. Okay. What was the next step for you? Um, I had the mole taken off. Then, because it was malignant, it obviously had to be cut again, take more skin away, just to be on the safe side. Um, and with that, there was also an option of having a biopsy down in London. In uh, February 2013, I had the option to go down to London for a biopsy which basically they put radioactive dye around the scar where your mole was, which then it's, for a better of a word, it looks like a meat probe that they check you for a hot spot on your body. Um, and if there is hot spots then, that is where they'll do the biopsies. I just assumed there would be one incision when I went down there, but I ended up having three. Um, there was a hot spot in my groin and a hot spot under my, left, under my right arm and they found melanoma in my right arm. My groin was clear. They redid my back. Um, so after that, I had to go back into Leicester Royal in the April uh, and have all my lymph nodes taken out from under my right arm, mm. which was very painful. It's quite a difficult procedure, is it, to have that? Or was it the after effects which were painful? The after effects were, you know, just the nerve endings. Um, mm. Two or three days, it, it, it got easier. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was a month off work. But um, it healed up quite well. Everything seemed to work okay. Um, and I was told that um, there was melanoma in the three out of the 11, I think it was, that was taken out. Mm -hmm. And they were encased in a shroud, which 
it hadn't escaped through the shroud, I was told. And basically, I got the all clear in the June. Okay. Which was good news, really. Yeah, definitely. Now, having had all those uh, little biopsies, did they have further information about the staging and the details of the outlook of the cancer? I know you got the all clear, which generally means you're in remission, but did they give you an estimate of the longer term at that stage? Not at the point, no. I, I was still quite naive with cancer, to be fair. I, mm. was, um, I assumed it was all curable. Mm -hmm. um, then I ended up speaking to one of the consultants in, in the hospital, on the phone actually, I was actually at work. Yeah. Um, and she sort of basically told me over the phone, which she wasn't happy about doing, that malignant melanoma is treatable, but not curable. Mm. Which uh, obviously upset me quite a bit then. And that was, you know, when I made, we made the decision to sort of finish the business that we had. Mm. Okay, so that was a big moment when they really changed your view of where you were, I guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And how did that affect your outlook on life in general? Uh, I'll be honest with you, I try not to think about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been, I have been given um, a rough life scale, mm -hmm. which is between two to five years. Mm -hmm. And if I see five years, there's a good chance I'll see another five. So I'll just carry on and enjoy what life I've got left. You know, yes. I, I try not to think about it. Yeah. The only time, I, don't, I wouldn't say I get worried. Mm. You know, if things appear, then... I'm straight back down to the hospital and mm. let them sort it out. But so in a sense... I, I'm entirely in their hands. You're not ignoring it because you do get attention when it's needed, but you're trying not to dwell on it unnecessarily? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just, just get on with my life, really. And is that successful? Are you able to put it to the back of your mind for quite a while, or is it always there in a way? No, I, I just... No, it's not there all the time. Mm -hmm. It's... Um, I'd be telling lies if I, sat, if I said I didn't think about it at all. Yes. You know, some nights you sit there watching TV and you, you mull things over and feel a bit guilty that, that you're not at work. Yeah. But then again, you know, I've just got to enjoy what life I've got left. How do you deal with reminders in the press, in the TV, or people asking you how you are? Does it provoke any anxiety in you? Not really. I, I, I actually had someone come up to me and and tell me that I'd only got six months left to live. Mm. And I said, oh, well, I don't know where you've had that from because I've never been ill with the condition. Yes. And I'm not sure what you're going to say to other people. Yeah. But um, I actually went onto Facebook then, which is something that I'm not familiar with, but I actually went onto Facebook just to put people in the picture and asked to, you know, just let them know what the situation was. So you put and a message out there. They've all been very supportive to mm. me, yeah. I've, it's amazing how many friends that you can have. You put a message out there that... I just told them that, you know, I was off to Leicester Royal for my chemotherapy mm -hmm. and, you know, I've had been in there three times. I've had no effects from it whatsoever mm -hmm. and various things like that. But yeah. um, I just keep people in the loop, really. What was the effect of putting that out there? What, what response did you get? Fantastic response from, you know, friends that wishing you all the best, good luck with everything. And it's quite overwhelming, really, what, you know, what people can can do to you really it's definitely uh, yeah it's been very it was quite emotional at times so a lot of friends um rallied round did they yeah mm. yeah quite a few yeah and people that you would wouldn't think um i had one guy after all the info i mean i don't know we're going on to the next phase but yeah i um i was struggling to walk after my chemo yeah and one of the guys on facebook i've known him for years but i've nothing to do with him mm. Um, I put a thing on there, but has anybody got a treadmill yeah. going spare that I could borrow? And within three hours, this guy had rang me, been and fetched it, erected it in the spare bedroom, and it was already enrolling. So wow. It's, yeah. People really... Yeah. Very overwhelmed, really. Yeah, they actually came to give you practical help. Yeah. And, and he would have been the last guy that I would have thought. probably ever envisaged doing it, you know. But yeah, yeah, you can't fault him. Amazing. You know. So you were in um, remission by all accounts, meaning the, can yeah. the cancer was initially treated. Um, but as we know, sometimes cancers come back. And what happened in your case? I was, so I was given the clear, all clear in June mm. uh, 2013. We did go away on holiday. We had two holidays after that, um, all in the sun. But I, mean, I did my best to keep out of it. 
Um, and then in January, I went back for a normal routine checkup, and um, the guy said, have you noticed these two spots under your arm? I said, well, I've always had them there mm. ever since the operation. Never really thought any more about it. Um, mm. So I got home and I'm, the wife was saying, how did you get on? And I was sort of changing my clothes to go back to work. And as I mentioned, I said, the usual thing, usual check my, my neck and my groin and under my arm. And as I said that, I felt the two lumps and there was two small hard pieces underneath. So I rang the, the hospital straight back and they had me in the following week where they said, let's, you know, we'll take them out. So mm. by the time the appointment was made and I went in to have them done, there was another spot, another small tumour came up under me, mm. under my right nipple. Mm -hmm. So I had three took off then. Mm. And within three weeks, there was another couple, or three, two or three appeared. So I went back in again in February to have those took off. And they were all treated and biopsied and they were all pretty much the same. Mm which coincided with the fact then that I had to have chemotherapy. Okay, so you, you had and that to have... was the diagnosis, basically, yeah. Was that further chemotherapy or the first lot? The first lot of chemotherapy. First lot? Yeah. And do you remember the type or the uh, regime you had? I was told by the consultant that he wanted to give me ipilipumab. Mm -hmm. But the first chemotherapy I had to have was the carbazin. But they had to give me that before they could apply for the epilipumab because I think it was so expensive to administrate. Yes. So I had one bag of chemotherapy, for a better word, of the decarbazin, and then I ended up having two lots of epilipumab. Mm. But I should have had four, but I, I was only well enough to have two. Okay. Um, I had no side effects really whatsoever. Really? Never affected me. Never affected me at all. Wow. But, That's encouraging. Uh, I did feel as if I was getting weaker. I was also in the process of getting rid and, and selling the factory with salt and selling all the machinery, clearing everything out. Um, and I could tell I was getting a bit weaker. And um, then after, after the third session of chemo, I actually I got a stomach bug then, mm. which I found out was colitis, mm. which put me back into hospital for five weeks. Okay. So you had a bit of a setback, a complication, if you like. Yeah, yeah. Um, was that related to the chemotherapy? It was, yes. Yeah. Mm. Presumably because you were immunosuppressed, you know, the immune system wasn't fully working. I probably underestimated the strength of the chemotherapy, to be fair. Yeah. Um, I probably should have, you know, probably not been at work. I should have probably just been resting. Okay. Um, and waiting for it to sort of take effect. But, uh, but given the side effects were mild, you probably thought you could do a bit more than you were advised at that point. Yeah, probably so, yeah. yeah. It was um, just a bit of a shock, really, to go down with the illness. Um, but it did knock me about. How did your body respond to the chemotherapy? What was the status after you'd had the treatment? In what respect? In terms of the outlook, did the cancer uh, respond? Sorry, yeah. Um, Guy said that he wouldn't give me any more, obviously because I wasn't well enough to have it. Yes, this is um, your oncologist, yes. Yes, sorry, yes. Um, he came round then, he looked at the, the tumours that had been taken out. Mm. I wasn't sure whether there was tumours growing back underneath mm. or whether it was just... Um, inflammation or... Inflammation yeah. or whether it was just the way that everything had been stitched together. Yeah. But after the, the second bout of chemo, and I'd, I'd probably been in hospital for three weeks then, um, guy came round and had a look and everything had gone really smooth everything had gone down flat under my arm and everything and he said everything it seems to be doing its job so we, we're not going to give you any more okay and that was the outcome really were you okay with that um well yeah um as i said i'm entirely in in guy's hands really absolutely and was that the last treatment you had or yep. was there further treatment to come no that was it as yeah. far as i'm aware i've got no more Okay. You know, unless it actually breaks out again. All right. How, how have things been between then and now? What's the situation now? Well, obviously, being in hospital for five weeks, I went down to 10 stone six from 13 stone, which you can imagine is a, a fair bit of weight loss. Mm. Um, I was very weak. Yes. Uh, very emotional. Um, got no confidence in myself at all. All my morals had gone. Um, it was a very emotional time when I got home, mm -hmm. trying to get back, mm. um, walking around the house or just shuffling around. 
Um, Guy did say that we needed to get you home for rest, which it was a big help because you couldn't sleep in the hospital anyway. Very difficult to sleep. Let's talk about the current situation. What's, what's the current status of your health? Well, at present, uh, the, the chemotherapy uh, has stabilised all the symptoms that I've got. Um, nothing's grown, nothing's got any smaller. The tumours I had taken out from under my right arm are all now smooth and I've been told that, you know, the chemo's done its job. Okay. So I'm assuming that I'm in remission now. Okay. Um, I'm due for another scan back in May. Yeah. Just to check that everything's okay. Mm. Uh, I've finished all my medication. Mm. Um, I'm still not quite right regards in regarding the colitis. Yes. I'm still sort of living with a irregular bowel system. Yeah. But um, I'm living with that. I'm coping with that. I've, I've obviously put a lot of weight back on. Good. Good. Um, I'm walking. Still a bit weak on my legs mm -hmm. and my arms, but just got to keep eating and drinking and build my strength back up. Really. Is the cancer present anywhere else in the body as far as you as know? As far as I'm aware, no. Mm -hmm. um, oh, sorry, I was diagnosed, there was a spot in my lung, mm -hmm. and there was a spot in somewhere in my back. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not got any bigger, and okay. it's not got any smaller. Okay. Um, I did question whether, they were, whether it is a tumour or whether it could be something else, and mm. they did seem to think it was a cancer. They did? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. But there's no treatment that you're having to have for that, right? No, it's all. I think the chemo is all part and parcel of the uh, of the stuff to do it. Okay, so you were talking about getting your strength back. Let's come on to that a little bit, if I can ask you, because people will be interested to know how you get back to your former self. So you were talking about doing a little bit more, gaining weight, maybe getting out. What What have you been doing in terms of um, getting back to normal, if you like? Well, when I came out of hospital, I was very, very weak. Um, I could not walk. I hadn't got the strength to sort of lift myself off a chair. Mm. Um, I got very emotional and very down. Mm -hmm. You know, every time I sort of had a shower, yeah. you look at yourself in the mirror and you think, you know, there's nothing on me. You know, I'm all skin and bone now, mm. which was, it was a bit difficult to start with. But, mm. but once I got my test results back and they were okay, I just seemed to perk up a little bit, mm. you know. It, the biggest thing was, was getting into the eating and drinking thing mm. because there were certain things I couldn't eat because it left a funny taste in my mouth. Mm. Um, drinking various things, some things agreed with me, some things didn't agree with me. Mm. Not so much that you'd be sick or anything like that. It, it's, when you swallow it, it doesn't give you a good feeling. Okay. But eventually everything's sort of coming back to normal now, so yeah. I'm just eating and drinking for England, as, as they say, and mm. it's... Um, at the minute, I'm putting weight on quite well. So, are you back to your previous weight? You know no, right? no, no. I'm no, yeah. at the minute. I think I'm about twelve stone four. Mm. I'm quite happy at that because all my clothes are fitting me again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But um, as regards getting out and about, I I actually I couldn't drive the car because I ain't got the strength in my legs to do the clutch and the brake and everything. That that probably lasted for about four or five weeks after I came out of hospital. But since I've been able to drive, then obviously I've been out and I've been walking more. Um, as I said before, I've got a. I managed to borrow a treadmill, mm. which was helping me to walk. What um, did you used to do on there? Just get on there and walk, really, because I was shuffling to start with. It was very, very slow, very slow work. Yeah. Um, but once, as I say, once I got out of the house, the exercise outside is better than doing it on a treadmill. Mm. It's harder out, you know, to do physically. Physically, walk is harder than walking on a treadmill. Have you got any particular routine? Not really, no, no. Um, obviously, I've got time with the wife now because my wife's had to pack up work. She's due to ill health, so I'm sort of looking after Yvonne and she's looking after me. So we actually spend a lot of time together now. We go out and do the shopping. You know, I can shuffle around Asda with a, with a trolley and something that I've never really done in my life. Um, it's just, I just get out and just do my normal, try and be as normal as possible now. Did you say she's been unwell, your wife? Yeah, my wife was diagnosed with early stages of dementia. September last year, mm. well, year before, sorry. Um, things sort of fell into place when it, when it all came out in the open. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, things that 
she couldn't get to grips with various things and she seemed a bit scared to go near the computer and I just couldn't figure out what the situation was. And then she came home from work one day and she was a bit quite upset and I, you know, I said, what's the matter? I, I thought the girls had got it in for her in her office. And she came home the following Tuesday and she was upset again and I rang her, her boss up on the following day and I, I couldn't get a word in because she said, well, I'm so glad you phoned because Yvonne's got a real problem forgetting things and one thing or another. She was making mistakes? Yes. Yeah. And that was due to that yeah. cognitive or memory problem? Um, being a medical secretary, she was advised to sort of leave, well, they basically said if you carry on making mistakes, you know, we're going to have to finish you. So she ended up taking um, redundancy due to ill health. Yes. So she's off work now. But, um, having been sort of ill before I went into hospital mm-hmm. for a week, Mm. I sort of spent a week to a week and a half at home mm. um, and you could actually see how I could see how bad she really was mm-hmm. but um, we get by we manage we look so after spend, each other so spending more time first of all it revealed the fact that she was having some problems to you it yeah. showed the extent of the problems but more importantly it perhaps enabled you to support each other yeah yeah I didn't. I mean, I knew there was something not right. Mm. I mean, I, we used to argue like cat and dog. Mm. But since she's, it's all been diagnosed, then everything's sort of changed and you can understand why she is. Yeah. Why she's doing what she's doing. Everybody loves Yvonne. Yes. You know, the friends and every, everybody. She's got a sort nice of, personality. Oh, fantastic. Everybody speaks highly of her. They always ask how she is. And, but um, it just takes a personality away. You know, yeah. she's sat there now. She doesn't really want to go anywhere. She's not confident to do anything. Is she retaining any interest? Uh, she's, she's never really had a lot of hobbies, to be fair. But mm. She's a keen football fan. Mm. She, she still likes the football. Oh, that's good. But um, and her sister's very supportive. She's always out with her sister at weekends. Yeah. Um, she's not short of friends, let's put it like that. You know? yeah. But... Uh, so coming back to yourself, yep. what was the um, support from the family, extended family? What was the support that you got like? You talked about the friendship support you got, but <clears throat> did the immediate family help out? Was it an issue to tell them what was going on? Well, they knew what were you know, they knew the situation. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got uh, two sisters and a brother. My mum and dad are still alive, and they, you know, they're all. My mum had a stroke um, around the same time as I was diagnosed with my mole um, so I was sort of going into the hospital seeing my mum saying I oh, don't worry mum you'll be okay I've got, I'll, I'll be in next week so I'm in mole off but uh, yeah they've been very supportive yeah. okay. they've been very good that's good I hear that you had your own business at the time you were unwell so what line of work was it you had built up? Well, as I said, I was a joiner by trade, but um, we ended up, I ended up sort of working in a factory in a joiner shop back in the 90s. And I met a guy there, a bit younger than myself, who was, uh, I thought, you know, a very good chippy, very trustworthy. So um, back in 1998, I started my own business. Right. It was when all the tax laws were changing around to being self-employed or employed, you've got to show that you were taking a risk. Yes. So I had a few shares in the bank and I cashed them in, a couple of grand, and ended up buying a planer and a saw and mm. set up my own little factory. Mm. And then in the October or November, I think Phil joined me as an equal partner and we just went on from there. Okay. Just making shop fittings, um, stuff for the retail industry, really. Did the business develop with time? Um, we never employed anybody. There was only the two of us. Mm-hmm. We used to sort of price the work, make it, go out and fit it. Mm. Um, it did develop, yeah. We ended up buying our own factory mm-hmm. uh, 10 years ago, which okay. was paid for last April. Okay, well done. Um, we were in a comfortable position. We, we weren't sort of breaking any records due to the fact they said there was going to be a recession. Mm. I think it was 2008, 2009. Mm. But we managed to cover us overheads, pay the wages, um, mm. and we made a reasonable living out of it. Mm. But uh, we've had 16 years working together yeah um, and then obviously Guy said that went to see my consultant and basically said with what I've got he says you know just sell your business and, and enjoy what life you've got left what did you think about that advice 
Uh, it was a bit of a shock, really, when he mm. when I first when he first told me. Yeah. But uh, deep down, I thought, well, that's all I can do, really. Mm. And then when it came to the fact, I found out it was treatable. Yeah. But not curable. Yes. That sort of set it straight. You know, with that, we both decided that we'd sell up and. I can go my way and Phil can go his way. And did it work out okay in the end? Yeah, not a problem at all. I mean, the factory was still in the process of being emptied and the machinery still had to be sold whilst I was ill in hospital. Yes. But uh, Phil sorted all that out. So no one took over the business as it was? You sold the assets? Yeah, we sold a lot. We sold the factory to the guys next door. Mm. Um, They've wanted it for, you know, we've always had give them first refusal. Mm -hmm. Um, All the machinery that we had, we actually sold. Mm. Um, and just basically empty the factory out and that was it. Okay. And how do you feel it's changed your life to give up that work that you put so much in? Well, it, it was a bit disappointing. Um, having said that, you know, every year seemed to be getting slightly more difficult for me, mm-hmm. personally. Mm. Um, whether or not I'd had enough deep down. Yeah. But um, I could always get a job somewhere if I need to. Sure. It's not an issue. Yeah. How do you think your lifestyle now um, is working out for you? Do you still get a sense of satisfaction with certain things? Um, I'm not sure. I'm is not it too sure. early to say? It's probably too early to say. Yeah. I'm not really. I've not really got used to the fact that I'm at home all the time. Do you have a role that you want to take up? Maybe something you're aiming for? Or is it something you're thinking about? Well, I'm going to enjoy myself for yeah. the next four or five years, I think. I've yeah. got enough money behind me to do that. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now the factory's been sold, I can do that. Then if, depending on how my treatment works out, if yes. I'm going to carry on living, then yeah, yeah. I may have to look for a job again. What about things that you um, are enjoying? Are you planning any holidays? What's the... Um, what's yes. the f- there is holidays in the pipeline. <laughs> we have a couple planned, actually. I'm going away uh, in about three weeks. We're going to the Caribbean for three weeks oh, on a cruise. Brilliant. Mm. And I'm back for about two months, and then we're going to Turkey for a week. Wow. There could be a motorhome in between. Okay. Um, and that's it at the minute. Okay. Te- you know, I don't want to go too mad too soon. Sounds good, though. But um, I fancy a motorhome just to tour around the country. Yeah. Probably keep that for a couple of three years. And yeah, then that's the way these days. Enjoy myself, I think. Definitely. Plus, then I'll be with a wife. She'll be there. You She'll be there. We'll, we'll be together. She'll you enjoy know. it. I think she will. I think yeah. she will. Well, I hope she will. Mm. But um, she enjoys the holidays. Yeah. That's. Um, but yeah, well, that's. I don't know. I mean, I've got things to do around the house. I mean, I'm not one to just sit around. I shall always no. be doing something. That's it. Now, I've got a question for you that I want you to have a think about from the audience point of view, which is, is there, are there any tips or advice that you'd like to give people if they were originally diagnosed like now, they're, wa- they're watching this, but they're just newly diagnosed. Um, is there anything that, from your experience of going through this that you would say, here's my advice to you? Uh, difficult to say. As I say, I don't really dwell on anything, but mm. I think, Think positive. Whatever, yeah, oh yeah, be, be positive. Mm-hmm. Never ever get negativity in your mind. Okay. I mean, I'm, I was determined it's not going to beat me. Mm. Um, listen to what the consultants say. Mm. Um, depending on how early you get diagnosed, will make a lot of difference Definitely. to the outcome. Mm. If you've got any doubts about moles or any sort of thing that's related to skin, then get it looked at pretty quick. Don't mess about like I did. No, that sounds And put your sun cream on. My last question for you then is, do you have any advice for the general population on avoiding skin cancer in general? Definitely, yeah. Put your sun cream on as soon as you go out in the sun. Yeah. Or before you go out in the sun. Yes. Don't be like me and yeah. wait for 20 minutes and then decide to put it on. Because mm. I think years gone by, that is the main factor that I've probably suffered. Mm. Um, I've had years in the building trade when I was apprentice. Sun's out, you're putting roofs on, you're up there with just a pair of shorts, no sun cream. Mm. You come home from work, your back's red raw. Yeah. Um, 
and that's probably where it's all started from. Okay, that's so really bad. In general, get your sun cream on. Yeah. And don't sit out in it too long. <laughs> well, look, it's been a pleasure uh, hearing your account. And as I said at the beginning, we haven't had many people with melanoma come in, so it's great to actually get the benefit of your experience. And I know the audience will also take a lot from what you've said. So thanks again for coming in today, and thanks for sharing your story. And uh, I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you. Hope you enjoy the motorhome. Yes, yeah, so do I. <laughs> I've just got to bring myself around to buy one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely going to enjoy the cruise though, that's the, uh, you know, quite looking forward to that. Brilliant. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.